Revelation 10, uh, Psalm 139, 16. In fact, turn to Psalm 139, 16. And um, let me see here. Let me get to, we already did that last week. All right. Psalm 139, 16. You turn there. And I'll read Revelation 10, the relevant part. And you're, you're going to see, uh, let's see, what's, what's next? Yep, 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 yep. You're going to see why between Revelation 5 and Revelation 10, um, the significance of, or one of the significances is, of this book being opened, okay? Why Jesus received it from his father. It was in his father's right hand. That's very important. Now, I cannot begin to tell you how important that is. Uh, do, like I said, do a study of the right hand in the Bible. Just type in right hand on a search software, blueletterbible.org is one place you can go, search King James. You can also download the software on your computer uh, at uh, purebiblesearch.com or .org, something like that, one of the two. And it'll go on a Mac, it'll go on a Windows, it'll go on a Linux computer. Uh, but anyway, uh, study the right hand and you'll just, you'll weep, you'll shout, you'll just have a good time. But anyway... Um, the significance of Christ then receiving it and then loosening the seals. And we saw a portion of that here a few weeks ago. Remember when Jesus was in the synagogue. Uh, he went into the synagogue and uh, it was his manner, his custom to come in and he stood up for to read and they gave him the book. And remember, this thing's rolled up like a scroll. And um, like, let me see, we got a picture of it here. Like that. Or, let's see here. I do have, yeah, like that. Okay. That's what would have been handed to Jesus for him to read. Obviously, you cannot fit the entire Old Testament on this one scroll, so I'm just guessing that they had different scrolls for different books. Well, they handed him the book of Isaiah, 66 chapters. It's a model of the entire Bible, 66 books. It, it's even neat because the New Testament starts with the 40th book, which is Matthew. And in the 40th chapter of Isaiah, uh, the, the very first part of Matthew is mentioned in Isaiah 40. Because in the first two chapters of Matthew, it talks about the lineage of Jesus and then John the Baptist coming, saying, um, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is nigh. And he is making the, he is going, preparing the way for the Lord, make his path straight. He's saying all of those things in the first two chapters of Matthew. And he's quoting from Isaiah 40, the 40th chapter. Then you get to the 66th book of the Bible, which is Revelation. And at the very end, it mentions, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, the first time a new heaven and a new earth is ever mentioned in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 66. First time it's ever mentioned, Brother George. And you're just, you, have, you have a micro picture of the macro word of God and the, and the plan of God. All right? So... Here's Jesus now, Revelation 10. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea, left foot upon the earth. That's dominion. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then Psalm um, 139, uh, in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. And that he is, David is describing DNA, I mean, almost forensically describing DNA and how it works in conception, how it works in uh, DNA, what is it called? 
when a cell is, um, when a new cell is made? Who's, who's our biology majors here? What's it called when a new cell is made? Anyway, um, cell, uh, cell, cell division is one of the terms. Uh, you got a cell, and in that cell, you've got a copy of the DNA of the, of the entire being of whatever that is. There's a whole copy of the DNA in every cell of every plant, every animal, every fish, every microbe. Uh, there's, it's a, just a beautiful picture of the tabernacle with the rolled up Word of God in it. So then, what Jesus did in Luke chapter 4 was... He stood up for to read, and he didn't read the entire book of Isaiah. He didn't, he didn't even read the entire chapter of Isaiah 61. He read a portion, I think, of verse 1. And, well, he read all of verse 1, and then he read a portion of verse 2. And he stopped mid-sentence, like when you take a breath. He stopped right there, and he closed the book up right then, and he said... This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In other words, just that part that he read was going to take place that day. And it was, had to do with Jesus being sent to preach the gospel and to bring the gospel to those who were in bondage. That's exactly how it worked when you were saved. The day or the night that you were saved, uh, the Holy Ghost was bearing down on you. Uh, you heard a preacher preach or maybe someone came to your home or whatever and, and somebody gave you the Romans road of salvation. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, John 3.16, 1 John 1.9. They, they didn't read the whole Bible to you and say, now do you believe that? They read only pieces of it to you, but that was enough to get things started. All it takes is just a seed. Amen. Plant a seed in somebody. Be nice to somebody and plant the seed, not of your own words, of Scripture into them and watch what God does with it. I mean, it'll surprise you what God can do. Amen? That's how, that's how cellular division and, and genetics work. Mitosis. Thank you very much. What's wrong with your toesies? Huh? Here's a cold. Maybe Cubby will grow some hair one day and you can knit you some socks out of it. Hi, Cubby. How you doing? Good to see you. Uh, but anyway, so, and like I said, when your body needs something, it doesn't read the entire genome over a billion lines of genes to read it doesn't read the whole thing your body actually this the cell has a catalog of where everything is and if your body needs insulin if it needs uh, a certain hormone if it needs a heart some heart tissue or some lung tissue or whatever, if it needs new skin tissue or whatever, it only reads the portion of the DNA that makes what your body needs at that exact moment. It reads that part of it. And the body makes that by folding proteins and putting it in the right place. That's, and it's, again, it's all governed by the book. What I'm doing right now is I'm following that exact same model. I don't come in here every Sunday, Sunday school and read the entire Bible to you and say, this is what God said. I give you little portions of it as God directs, especially on the Sunday morning sermon. To me, that's the most important one. And I really want God to tell me what to preach on any given Sunday. Sometimes I've come in here, changed my message. Why? Because God knows that somebody, part of his body here or there on that camera, needs what I'm going to preach that day. God has me open the book, read what I'm supposed to preach on, give it out to everybody, and when I'm done, close the book. And God is going to do that thing 
in somebody's life. I've preached some of the worst messages that could ever be preached by any preacher ever in the world and walked down thinking that was dumb, that was stupid, was God get me out of this place. And then someone sent me a text said, Pastor Mike, I am crying like a baby for you to preach that today. How did you know that that's exactly what was going on in my life? I didn't. The book did. The book did. And the book is Jesus Christ. Jesus always knows what you need. Somebody say amen. So I'm going to show you how that works. Okay? Look at this. Well, we covered that last week. All right. Uh, okay, we talked about that. God is not the author of confusion. Looking at Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. He became the author of eternal salvation. So watch this now. So we have it. Uh, let me get a pen here. A uh, felt tip pen will do. So we have in thy book, which is the Bible. All my members were written. Notice this is a, like a church in Kenya because that's where I was originally taught this. And they're just as much as members as we are here. Amen? All my members were written. All those people standing in front of a church, they are members written by God. By God. In fact, there's a verse. Paul says it. He says, um, you, you are our epistle. Um, Written, I think, it's, I think it says written by God or written of God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. God himself wrote your name in his book of life. Amen. So in thy book, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned. Here's people down at the altar getting saved. God or God is doing certain things in their life with a passage of scripture that some preacher preached that day or that night, when as yet, on the day of Pentecost, there was none of them. There was just the, the 12 disciples, you had 120 in the upper room all together, and that's it. But as soon as the word of God was preached, what happened immediately after that? 3,000 people fell to their knees and said, what must we do to be saved? And God saved them. Isn't that something? And did Peter preach the whole Bible to them? He preached a little portion out of Joel and said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet. Okay? And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you go read that in if you read what Peter said in Acts 2 and go read in Joel 2 what Joel said, you'll see also that Peter cut that off mid-sentence. Because in Joel 2, after it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then there's a, there's a um, semicolon there in our King James and a continuation of that verse and of that prophecy. It's in chapter 2. There's still half of chapter 2 and the rest of chapter 3 to take place. But Peter cut it off after whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved because that's what the Holy Ghost told him to do because God wasn't ready to do everything in Joel right then and there. And the evidence is that the sun and the moon were not darkened. The moon was not turned to blood. There was not uh, vapors and pillars of smoke. Uh, none of those things happen on the day of Pentecost. So what does that mean? It means that they have yet to be fulfilled. God is yet going to do them, okay? Now, so that's how that, that's a, and that model, I call it evangelism 101. Let me read this to you real quickly. And, it's, and, it, and you, some people say, well, I like reading the Bible, but when you get into all them begattings and he begat this and he begat that, I just kind of skip over, don't skip over that. That's the most important part in some in some areas this is the book of the generations of adam so already god is using the word book to describe genetics genealogy genesis all of those words are related genesis genealogy genetics they're all related 
and they have to do with what's in the book. So in the book of the generations of Adam, and did Adam pass his genes down to another generation? Yes. Seth. At first he did it with Cain. And then he passed them down to Abel. But Cain slew Abel. Cain then is marked and called out by God and made him to be a vagabond and a wanderer. And Cain's lineage did not survive the flood. So Adam had to produce another seed, we call it. Another, another mitosis is going to take place. Adam is going to donate his genes. Eve is going to donate her genes. And they're going to be put together to make 46 chromosomes. And Seth is going to be just like his mama and just like his daddy. The Bible calls it in the spirit and image of God created he them. So when God created Adam, he created Adam in God's image and spirit. And when Adam passed those genes on down the line, every human being, and this is something you got to remember. When you get mad at somebody, Friday, God was dealing with me, okay? Because I'm like, I, I get these stores are so busy now, and especially when they find out it's going to snow, okay? And I take Lisa wherever she wants to go shopping, and we get in some busy store, and I'm already grumpy, I don't like people pushing their cart in front of me. I don't like people stopping in the middle of the aisle. And I'm kind of getting to where I'm saying stuff out loud, but just low enough to where maybe they can't hear me, but I want them to hear me. Yeah, it is. You, hey, you come up here and confess your sins. And God dealt with me. I said, Mike, wouldn't it be better to just smile and be nice to everybody? Yeah. And so right there in Costco, God changed me, made me a little bit better to deal with. Not so grumpy and mean and hateful and amen. So, but I got those genes, honestly. Right? Oh, no, I'm not looking. I'm looking right at you, big mama. Um. So this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. And the day and in the day when they were created and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image. See it? And he called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. And, and I have Evangelism 101 written because that is exactly how someone is born again. The word is received. The, word, the seed is planted. Now, whether that's in the ground or in the mother, that seed is planted. And so I have up here a seed, one cell with all the chromosomes, all the genes, all the DNA that, oh, let's see, who can I pick on now? Kyle, I don't pick on Kyle very much. So this is a picture of Kyle day one. This is what he looks like. Not much, is there, right? Well, when we got saved, there wasn't much there either. Amen? But did God have plans? Did God already write everything that Kyle was going to end up having in his body right there? See, DNA is a book of prophecy. And those prophecies get fulfilled. In, in biology, it's called gene expression. Whenever, whenever, like I said, whenever, let's say, your body needs insulin, then the DNA kicks into gear and expresses the gene. That's just a scientific term for it read, it read the DNA 
and it gathered the proteins that it needed and it folded them in the right way and made just like doing this with with clay or play-doh and it made exactly what Kyle's body needed and put it in the exact right place okay and then the the RNA polymerase went looking for something else to make because it's always making something so then Kyle gets excited and Kyle's happy to be saved and he's tickled to death man and so he finds somebody he knows somebody he works with or somebody in his family and they're saying Kyle there's something different with you man what's going on well I hate to tell you this I got religion and everybody is going oh no but there's always one person who wants to hear why Kyle's different and so Kyle then when he got saved he was given a big old King James Bible and Kyle been reading that Bible and Kyle remembers he had underlined the verses in there that lead somebody to Jesus that somebody read to him so what does Kyle do Kyle reads the verses to this person the seed is planted in them and then the, that person becomes exactly see I have two of these down here see these two do they look exactly alike the two on the bottom why they came from the same the if Kyle used the King James to lead this person to Jesus then that person followed Jesus based upon what was written in this book we gave them a copy of a King James Bible they read it and they're turning into exactly what God is making Kyle into and that is in his image and so that person gets excited and they witness to somebody I mean I'm talking about how it happened ever since the day of Pentecost to this day and beyond this is still going on just like the cells are dividing in your body because when the cell divides it sends over a perfect copy of your DNA from the old cell so that the new cell is exactly like the old cell this is why I don't believe it's right for a church to have five or six different translations that they throw up on the screen how can you have everybody be common and believe the same thing if you're giving them stop and think about it for a minute uh oh I mean, this happens a married woman shows up pregnant she pretends to be excited her husband is thinking he's gonna have a child hoping it's a boy and the child is born but the child's not the same color as the mom and dad whoops does that I mean let's just get honest what do we know what do we know mama slept around with somebody that was not her husband and that happens say amen or the child is the same color but there's just nothing in that child that is that looks like or acts like dad and after a while dad wants to know and so what does dad do what does he do DNA, DNA test because the DNA test will tell absolutely 100% for sure who the father was 100% and there's no arguing with it and it's the same way with these books that are read in the churches if a preacher comes in here so I've got some preachers coming that I know are going to preach King James but if they come and you hear a verse and you can tell it ain't King James you look it up and you're going that that ain't King James 
Where, where did Pastor Mike get this guy from? You're going to know instantly, this guy ain't preaching right. He's not preaching according to my wishes, not preaching according to what I would guess is the majority of this church's wishes, and you would know it. And when I got back, then I would know it. And unless this guy repented, I would not have them come back to my church. Can you say amen? It's the same thing. Because he is going to end up planning. Turn to 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter. Chapter 1. First Peter, second. Oh, no, second Peter. No, first Peter. It's first Peter. Chapter one. Look at verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Being born again, of incorruptible seed by the word of God. There is a corruptible seed and there is an incorruptible seed. One will last, one will not. And I can already tell you, I can already prove to you by examples which ones won't last. I'll take the NIV for example. 1973, and I have a copy on my desk. I found it at a, at a resale shop. It's a copy of the 1973 version of the NIV. I've had uh, one of the girls here go through it, and, t and it took her probably a couple months, but she went and compared the 1973 NIV with the 2020 NIV, or whatever the latest NIV is. The latest edition of the NIV is, um, it was called the TNIV, today's NIV, but it's basically the gender-neutral Bible that nobody in America wanted, but we got, they got them anyway. But I can tell you, without any doubt in my mind whatsoever, that the New International Version has been re-copyrighted five times since 1973. What that means is it, its contents have been altered five times and they had to apply for a new copyright five times. So she's in there looking at verses in the 1973 NIV and she has the latest edition of the NIV from Blue Letter Bible up on the screen and it doesn't take her long to find a verse that says it one way in 73 and says it another way in 2020. And she copies and pastes those verses down. And I have a manuscript, I don't know how big it is, but it's full of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of alterations that have been made to the NIV since 1973. Now, how, number one, how can you memorize scripture? If they're always changing it, um, it would, <laughs> it's sort of like the IRS changing the tax code every month. We get a copy of TurboTax in December, and every time Lisa loads TurboTax up into her laptop, the software has to check with the IRS to get the latest changes in the tax code. And it takes months to get our taxes done that way. I'm just saying to you, any Bible where they had to keep changing the translation over and over and over and over again, that's confusion, and God is not the author of that. Meanwhile, you've got a King James here. Somebody give me a verse. Somebody give me a verse. Your favorite verse. Huh? 2 Timothy 2.15. Everybody turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. What I have in my hand here is a 1611 
King James Bible. A reprint. That's Philippians, Ephesians. The letters are a little different, but the words... Let's see, Ephesians. First, okay, I'm past it already. First, set the second, second Timothy. I'm one hoggard. Three, two, fifteen. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Perfect. I can stand here all day and do this. You tell me where to turn, I'll read it from the 1611 Bible. You can take my word, you can come up here and do it yourself, or there's a booklet that the American Bible Society in 1850, 18. 50, 10 years before the Civil War, the American Bible Society took up the question of whether or not the authorized Bible was different in 1850 than it was in 1611. And so they went in to research the matter. They wrote a book or a little booklet. It's, it's free on Google Books. And what they wrote in there was a report about what they discovered. And they said, obviously, there are printing mistakes because back in 1611, they took letters one at a time and put them in backwards onto a, basically a, a wood holder and verse by verse, word by word, letter by letter, put all the, the letters in on a block of wood and tighten them all down and use them. They would roll the ink press it on the paper, roll the ink, press it on the paper, and that's how they made those copies back in 1611. So there were mistakes in the printing. The spelling of the words is slightly different. The word study thyself, I don't have it pulled up there, uh, study, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I can't remember which of the words were spelled differently there, but as I read them, and I read them the way they were on the page, you did not hear any difference in the reading of those words. Okay? They are the, so other than spelling and other than printing mistakes, in 1850, the American Bible Society said that we have the Word of God given to us without changing from 1611 down to this very day. And then we know from 1850 on, we have the same Bible as they had in 1850 because it's easy to find copies that old. Okay? Uh, somebody, uh, as a gift, sent me a copy, a page out of the original printing 1611 King James Bible uh, in a nice little uh, picture frame. And when I opened that thing up, I started crying. Because I didn't know you could do that, but there's a company that sells pages. They'll sell you a whole one. It's thousands of dollars. But they'll sell pages out of, you know, Bibles that have been torn and things like that. But they'll, they'll take the intact pages and take them out one by one and frame them. And you can buy one for yourself or you can buy one as a gift for somebody else. And that's on the wall in my office. If you want to go in there, it's from the book of Exodus. You want to go in there and compare this King James to that King James, you'll find it's exactly the same. And what I'm telling you is, God's word is incorruptible. And the devil has tried to corrupt it. Now, now, think about what the devil is doing with human genes. He's trying to corrupt the book. Because what species... On planet Earth, does God offer salvation to? Just one species. And a species is defined by genetics. It's defined by genetics. So if a, if a person is altered in their genetics, 
say, with monkey DNA. Or maybe DNA from cows. Why would they put DNA from cows in people? They, they've tested it, I think. I'm not going to say for sure on this one. But they're looking at people who are lactose intolerant. And they say, we can fix that. We can alter just one or two genes, just one or two genes in the Bible, just one or two words in the genes, we can alter those to be that of like a, a baby calf, and baby calves are not lactose intolerant. And so anybody that's lactose intolerant, we can switch just a couple of words in the Bible, and that's all we have to do. And you say, well, a couple of words, well, that's no big deal. Oh, I think it is. I think it makes a difference. Okay. Well, in fact, turn to John 1. I didn't mean to get off on this, but th I'm, this is what DNA does. Your DNA in your body does not automatically change species. That has to be done by the hands of man. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Does God dwell in temples made by hands? No. So if man alters this temple, will God dwell in it? No. Now look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Huh? Don't correct me. <laughs> By what authority? Jehovah's Witness Bible says was a God. All they did was add one letter. But did you know that once somebody who, let's say somebody's, a Jehovah's Witness is going to witness to somebody. Once they get them convinced that John 1.1 1, 1 is not right in a King James or any other Bible, they'll show them the New World Translation. It says, the original says, was a God. And once a person accepts that in their mind, their view of Christ in no matter what Bible they're reading, their view of Christ is automatically altered. Because now they've accepted the belief that Christ was a lesser God than God the Father. And he's not. Paul said that Jesus Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I and my Father are one. And when you add one letter to John 1.1, 1, 1, you have altered the entire meaning of who Jesus Christ was. Is that significant or not? Extremely. So what you have here is you have the Apostle Paul. Oh, they're not going to ring a bell, are they? Lisa's up at the hospital with Michaela in case they have surgery. Rose is home. Uh, so I'll quit here in a minute. Look up on the screen. You have the Apostle Paul. He's writing the Word of God. And then he goes to Mars Hill to preach it. And at Mars Hill, people are hearing about the unknown God. And he's telling them who it is. And I'm sure that Paul made some converts there that day. And there now is, I guess, Paul, or maybe, maybe this is Timothy there in the red robe with, no, it's Paul because he's in chains. Paul's in chains here, but what is he doing? He is writing out more of his, to, and he's teaching to this young man the word of God. That's what First and Second Timothy was all about. It was Paul teaching Timothy about what it takes to be a bishop and how he can be qualified and to stand true with the doctrines. And 2 Timothy, we know, is the last book that Paul wrote on this earth. And he told Timothy, Timothy, stick with the scriptures. In fact, I thought you were going to say 2, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay? But that's how... Cellular division, mitosis, works. I'm preaching the word or you're reading the word and God is doing something in you. God is changing something in you. 
God is reforming you to look in the image of Jesus Christ. Boy, you're lucky I'm going to be gone in Kenya for three weeks. Because this is, I'm going to try to make this simple. But wait till you see how the body reads DNA. Where do you see it? It, it's, I've known this now for probably 15 to 20 years, and I am still amazed at it. I'm still in awe over it. And I'm not exaggerating either. But let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We do thank you for it. And Lord, I love, I love this book. This, this book was what saved me. And then, Lord, when you revived this book in me, it saved my life. It saved my ministry. It saved everything that needed saving. And, Father, I thank you for giving us the incorruptible word of God. Lord, I know the devil's tried to change it, to alter it. Even in my mind, he's tried to do that. But I thank you that your word not only is not corrupted, it is not able to be corrupted. It is incorruptible. Father, bless this teaching today. Bless the preaching this morning. And bless those, Father, bless my family. Bless this church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.